to make these two videotapes on experimental technique. We've come to the Department of Chemistry in the University of Manchester during the vacation. Many famous organic chemists have worked in this department, including Perkin and Robinson, whose annulation reaction we study in the course. While you were studying the second level course, you came across several basic techniques for separation and purification. At the second level summer school, you were able to practice some of these techniques on compounds that were obtained in reactions carried out at room temperature or just above or below, and in apparatus which was either open to the atmosphere or had simple protection against atmospheric moisture. In these two tapes, I shall hope to show you some more sophisticated techniques that are needed in the organic laboratory, and I hope you'll have a chance to try out some of them at the third level summer school. Let's begin with extraction. The simple separating funnel is fine if we have an extraction where partition favors the extracting solvent. But in some cases, say we want to extract an organic acid from an aqueous solution, the product we want may be only slightly soluble in the extracting solvent. In a case like this, it is better to use a continuous extraction apparatus. And we have one here set up to extract an aqueous layer with an organic solvent which is more dense than water. Let's look at the features. In the flask here, we have refluxing solvent, and the vapor ascends into the condenser and drips back through the aqueous solution, extracting our compound as it goes. Organic solution is then returned from the base of the tube back to the flask, and more extracting vapor and solvent is continuously regenerated. Now, it might seem a bit of a bother to have to set up an apparatus like this, but in fact, it only takes about as long as doing two conventional funnel separations, and it does give you the added advantage that you have only a small amount of liquid when you reach the end. A second problem, which can also be solved by a continuous extraction technique, is where we need to leach a solid from a reaction product or from a natural material. It could be, say, a Wittig reaction, like this one. Or it could be natural product like these heartwood shavings. The solid material is packed into one of these filter paper thimbles. And the thimble is placed in one of these automatic siphons. If we look at the diagram of the apparatus here, we see that the siphon is placed between the refluxing solvent and the condenser. This apparatus is called a Soxlet apparatus, after its inventor. Let's look at the apparatus itself. We see that the refluxing solvent rises past the thimble in the siphon, and because it, this vapor is hot, it heats up the extracting solvent, thus making it an even better extracting medium. The product that we get from our extraction process may be pure, but it's more likely to be contaminated with tarry or polar materials, especially if it's a natural product. To purify a reaction product such as this, we can use flash chromatography. Flash chromatography is really only a sophisticated form of filtration, but instead of only solid particles being held behind on a filter paper, we're able to absorb polar and tarry materials on the column packing, the absorbent material. Here we have a column. These columns are normally packed dry.
Our extract is added in the usual way. and a looting solvent is then added. Elution may take place under gravity, but more usually, suction is applied. Alternatively, we can use a pump system, such as we have here. The reason we need to use suction or pumping is because the absorbent we use in these flash chromatography columns is much of much finer particle size than that we would normally use for column chromatography. Its particle size is also very uniform. If our extract turns out to be a liquid, the normal way we would purify that would be through distillation. But we have a serious problem here because a great many liquids begin to decompose or oxidize before their boiling temperature is reached. We overcome this difficulty by using distillation at reduced pressure, or vac distillation as it's usually called. This is something we hope you'll be able to try at the third level summer school. If we look at this graph of pressure against temperature, we see there is no simple relationship between the pressure and the boiling temperature of a liquid. But it is clear that it is a much, there is a much more dramatic fall in temperature when we get to low pressures than when we're operating near to atmospheric. If we want a pressure of around about 20 or 30 millimeters, we're able to achieve this using a simple water pump, provided that it's efficient. A pump of this sort always has to be turned fully on when we're using it for distillation. If we need lower pressures than that, we have to use a rotary oil pump, and we have one here. In order to avoid contaminating the oil in the pump with organic vapors from our reaction, we need to intersperse a trap between the pump and the reaction vessel. This is filled with acetone and dry ice, which gives us a temperature low enough to freeze out the organic vapor. We measure the pressure on this McLeod gauge. And you can see it is recording a pressure well below one millimeter. Let's now compare the techniques of reduced pressure distillation and simple distillation. Because we're using reduced pressure, we have to do vac distillation in a fume cupboard or behind the safety screen. Today we'll look at a diagram of the simple distillation apparatus and compare it with the reduced pressure distillation apparatus. Looking at this diagram, 
we see there are two problems to be overcome. At this end of the apparatus, we have the problem of replacing the receiver. The only way to do this would be to let air into the system, to take it off, and then put a new one on. That would be a nuisance. At this end, we have the problem of bumping. Anti-bumping granules don't work under reduced pressure. And if we do have bumping in this flask, undistilled liquid can splash up the column and contaminate liquid which is distilling over through the condenser. We see how we solve these two problems on the diagram here. At this end of the apparatus, we use a device known as a pig. I have one here. You see it has three takeoff points, and by rotating, this well-greased joint, we can allow the distillate to run first through this one into a flask, then through this, and thirdly through this one. You'll see that the still head has a vigour column built into it. I've got a larger one here to show you. Into the tube are pressed these glass points, which not only increase the surface area, and so allow the column to act as a fractionating column. They're also quite efficient at catching any material which bumps up the column. We also solve the bumping problem by using this air bleed. A fine stream of bubbles is drawn constantly through the bleed and agitates the surface of the liquid, giving us even boiling. If we have only a small volume of liquid, we don't need to use an air bleed. We can use a flask filled with glass wool instead, which also ensures even distillation. But as most of you who will be doing this experiment at summer school will use an air bleed, I'll show you how to make one now. We use a bit of soft glass tubing, like one of these disposable pipettes, which we heat in a Bunsen flame. As the glass softens, it also runs together to give a thicker walled tube. And the first step is the pulling of a short, thick walled capillary. We then repeat the whole process with the final step, the drawing of a long, fine tube. The capillary has to be strong and flexible, but of course it also has to have a hole through the middle. And we check for this by blowing through the capillary into a liquid of low viscosity. Let's now look at a real vacuum distillation apparatus in operation. We've set up our vac distillation apparatus here in the fume cupboard. Note the safety screen between ourselves and the apparatus. We're using an oil bath here to heat our liquid with a temperature which is some degrees, 10, 20 degrees above the expected boiling temperature of the liquid in the flask. Note the stream of bubbles through the bleed, which is constantly agitating the surface of the liquid, giving us even boiling. In this setup, we've used nitrogen from a balloon to pass through our air bleed to prevent any oxidation of the hot liquid as it, as it distills over. We can see that the temperature of distillation is about 40 degrees. And if we go to the other end of the apparatus, we can see that our water pump is giving us about 30 millimeters of pressure. 
If we look on the graph that we saw previously, we see that this fits the expected temperature and pressure for the boiling point of chlorobenzene, which is in fact what we have in the flask here. Now that we've reached our expected temperature and taken off our pre-run, we can adjust the pig and begin to collect our main fraction through the second outlet. When we finish a vac distillation, we continue to draw nitrogen through the liquid, any liquid that's left as it cools down, to prevent it oxidizing when open to the air. Now this equipment may look rather complicated, but it really is very straightforward in use, as many of you will find when you come to do it at summer school.